the broad way revealed. Matthew 7 verses 13 to 14 Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The reader is likely to understand this verse as referring to truth itself, or to Jesus as the narrow way. In this presentation we must love the truth as itself or in the form of Jesus. This might be so, this might be a valid interpretation, but that still only solves half the puzzle. Let's accept that the narrow way is Jesus and the truth he represents, but what is the broad way? Does it have as concrete a representation as the narrow way? Is it enough to just say the broad way is everything other than what is true or not represented by Jesus? The broad way is not usefully defined as everything that is not true, as this suggests it is the symptoms that are the problem, rather than the disease. Lies are a problem but they do not constitute a way. Rejecting Jesus is certainly wrong, but it cannot really be seen as the smooth road most people are on. Democracy is however something most people revere which takes us in the wrong direction. One can broaden this characterization even further. The broad way is not totally encapsulated by democracy, in the widest possible sense of the term, the broad path is liberalism. The most simplistic way to think of the broad way is as the way of the flesh. But if the broad way is a way, in the sense that the narrow path is a clear and concise method to salvation, then we have to assume the broad way has more substance than suggested by a reference to the flesh. We certainly need something more substantial than a generalized reference to that which is not Christianity, to understand this wrong path. After all, let's be honest and accept, not all those who profess Christ are known by our Savior. Now it is common to assume democracy is better than tyranny, and it is, at least from the perspective of the oppressed who live in one of these countries. Yet, there is no man able to dominate more than a handful of people, at any one time. Regardless of the tyranny, the dictator will have supporters and others to whom he relies on, for support. It is ridiculous to believe a tyrant is a dictator in all of his relationships. It is truer to say a dictatorship has a smaller group of voters than a conventional democracy. Even Athens was despotic, in that it was ruled by a relatively small number of very wealthy men. They were mostly old white men, for those who hate old white men. Democracy, if it is to be defined, is better defined by the amount of debate that precedes the making of a decision than by the level of power held by a ruler. In conventional democracies, there is a considerable amount of debate, in a tyranny, there is debate but less of it and it often has less impact on the final decision. Even mayors may have considerable power vis a vis the council and the electorate, but they are still considered part of the democratic state. Democracy is a reaction to the elimination of tribalism by Nimrod. The implementation of a formal government over disparate peoples ended the tribal system. The Babylonian system that pervades the world's nations, however, was too dependent on the existence of a strong leader. Babylon was and is a corrupt and demonic system designed to destroy what God provided. But the power of a king or tyrant was too limited to operate a globalist empire. From out of the constraints of the divine right of kings arose democracy. Democracy makes the subject complicit in his oppression. As a subject of the state, we think we have a vested interest in protecting democracy. We are told we have a duty to protect democracy. But there are implications that flow from the protection of democracy. Satan and his demons must be treated fairly, equally, and with respect, by law, according to the principles of democracy. If there are more evildoers who vote for the devil's minions than there are Christians who vote for the agenda of Christ, then Christians are required to respect the win. We, as Christians, must live by the rules produced by the doers of evil if they win the election, for that is democracy. This is why we are told democracy has to be protected at all costs, even if it means an eternity in hell. Otherwise, Christians might rise up and implement the church and leave behind the democratic state. Satan wants to keep us committed to the protection of democracy. If democracy is the priority, then we will voluntarily prevent our Christian faith from assuming precedence in our life. The priority will always be the need to protect democracy. Good and evil have equal standing in our Western societies, because it is the elections we periodically hold that determines which influence will hold sway over our communities. 
So, when you are told to protect our democracy, and when you hear that the left say it is fighting for democracy, remember what they are fighting for, the equality of good and evil, before the law. Those who oppose what they see going on in the world do not just need to invoke a response, we need a way to quantify the process. A successful response is not about numbers of persons signed up to a movement, thinking this way is a big mistake to make, it allows the movement to be infiltrated. We cannot just look for members. We have to think in terms of ideas. The world is one idea, and those who reject this world need a replacement idea to build on. It is the idea we need to promote and build, by means of elaboration, not the numbers who seem to share our concerns. Democracy is an idea that we know has negative repercussions. DEI and socialism are other ideas, they are all connected to a single corruption that has its roots, its conception, in Eden, but the idea was birthed in Babylon. It is the idea of common ownership, or the idea we all have a claim to everything that exists. On this idea the state takes power, for the state poses as the administrator of competing claims. If we subscribe to this idea from which we derive communism, we subscribe to the idea anyone can come and take what we have, anyone has a claim on what we produce. This is not biblical. And therein is the problem, because if you refuse to subscribe to the idea that gave rise to scripture, you have rejected the only idea that can defeat the world. Without Jesus and his church there is no defense against the flesh, and you will be taken over. So, if you are emotionally averse to Christianity, do not bother complaining or whining because you have already lost the fight. No matter what things look like, it is always a battle of ideas. There is no way to vote oneself out of a democracy, God however, did an end run around Babylon and the democratic system. We need to come out of it. This second exodus means the end of democracy, at least for those in the church. Morality is no more defined by the popular vote than truth is. One, therefore, cannot vote in a moral government and the government cannot decide issues by a majority vote. That is not how morality works, that is how the law works. The law is based on power and power is based on things like the control of property and the tools of violence. The Babylon model is based on the law of the jungle, on the use of power to enforce compliance. The ways of doing this are many. The natural law model of government extends along a continuum of violence. The natural law government model goes from the most dictatorial tyranny to a virtual commune. They all have ways of enforcing compliance. Many people think democracy and the various models of tyranny are separate things, but they all have some form of decision making that is hierarchical and ownership models that rely on legal rights. Legal rights all come from the state. So, in Babylon the state owns the nation and those who live in it and are subject to it. The state assigns rights, which are privileges, to its subjects. These rights permit the subject to license property from the state, with exceptions. We cannot do with this property what we choose. Because the state always retains an interest in the property, we have to get the state's permission to modify it outside of permitted uses. All property has a liability attached to it, equal to the state's interest in the property. We can vote and move freely, with certain restrictions that vary from nation to nation. We can talk and associate freely, within the legal limits set down by the state. Babylon has two major features, it is not tribal, and it is legalistic. Babylon sees diversity as a positive, as diversity is a direct rebuttal of the tribal form of organization. The law moves us away from the paternalism of the tribes into an institutional structure. Government is by appointment and law by a formal process. We see a progression away from tyrants and hereditary monarchs to democratic institutions, where authority belongs to the office, not the office holder. One could look at the process as one of inclusion. More people are indoctrinated into the cult of power. But what does power mean if it is derived from a single source that has veto power? In the tribe, the elder male generally held power. The larger the tribe the more power might be shared among the elder males of a family. However tribal power was always limited by the size of the tribe and the discipline that could be imposed on the family by the elder male. When tribal authority was replaced by an institutional office, such as king, the inheritance of power from father to eldest son still prevailed, but it was no longer a familial thing. The support system was far more diffuse and uncertain. Allegiances could and did change. 
Ruling dynasties were often overthrown, sometimes by upstarts, sometimes by peripheral family members and sometimes by outsiders. Royalty was very much dependent on the genes of the family and the influence the ruler had over other powerful agents, beyond the simple power that was expressed by military might. The king needed to express royalty to his subjects and his neighboring states. The role of the tyrant king gave way to imperial courts in which nobles were allowed their say. With the rise in capitalism, the nouveau riche pushed their way closer to the seat of power. Over time as the importance of agriculture declined and manufacturing took center stage, the vote was extended to landowning men and later to all men and finally to women. But democracy was never a good idea. Just because the tyranny of one gave way to the tyranny of the majority is not to say at some point tyranny took on the mantle of good. We ought to remember that, for the West, democracy was borrowed from a slave-owning oligarchy whose men had little else to do but debate. Jesus was not put to death by Romans or Jews but by a tyranny of the majority who voted to release a murderer and crucify Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 14 to 18 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The broad way is generally speaking the way of the world, the way of the flesh, encapsulated in the story of Babylon, and also in its history. In modern terms we can think of Babylon as liberalism. It is a story both of tyranny and licentiousness, as freedom is found both in the sexual libertines and the tyranny of sadists. However, all of this power is nothing more than the law of the jungle given a patina of legitimacy. Power remains as the justifier of rights. The divine right of kings and the power of the people is nothing more than a way to bring into the public square the proposition that might makes right and the end justifies the means. In the tribe the power was centered on the father simply because of honor and respect. The father did not have to be the strongest, wisest, or the most noble, as he was the father or the extended family that generally made up the tribe. But when these familial bonds were shattered by Nimrod, a new way had to be found to legitimize power, the new model of power was expressed as a ruler's ability to rain down terror on his subjects. His personal power to do damage to his opponent was institutionalized into a monopoly on military force, later rephrased as justice. Regardless, it meant that the ruler was the sole source of legitimate power. The power of the state was formulated into laws, and laws became a way to regulate kingdoms in a way that gave the lawmaker legitimacy. Yet, at the root of all of this was still the sword. Common to all forms of government is the need to extract the resources governments need from the subject peoples. We have come to regard this imposition of law by means of military and paramilitary might, natural and perhaps unavoidable. Someone has to rule and regardless of our personal preferences, it will always be the one who wields the biggest sword. But this is neither natural nor necessary. In some ways the law of the jungle is the natural law. In nature might makes right and the end justifies the means. There is no way to adjudicate disagreements other than by the use of physical force or by a show of force. But that does not mean this way of living ought to be carried over into the artificial reality of man. We do not need to live by the law that governs nature nor by our ability to use physical or military power. But the state has no means by which to support itself other than by extracting wealth from others, and so they need access to the military and police to acquire what they need to sustain themselves and their authority. But it still takes more than armed might to remain in control in a democracy. The one place the army cannot go is in the ballot box, and so the state must justify its existence in some other way. It cannot exist solely to extract the wealth needed to sustain itself. Therefore, not only does the state extract the wealth it needs for its own use, it extracts the wealth it needs to justify its existence. This we know of as taxation. The state takes on the job of maintaining law and order as a benefit to its subjects. To do this it creates laws, which are guidelines to what is permitted. 
However, this is the minimum that the state can do. To do it, to administrate the law, the state needs a system of justice, and this requires a bureaucracy. This administration of justice was probably sufficient to justify the early state. But when democracy became the norm, the activities of the state were expanded. The modern state needs to make itself important to a large number of constituencies. The two-party system, as is true with so much else, began in England in the 1700s. But the state itself was founded by Nimrod. Much of what the state is, had its origins in Babylon. The Babylonian diaspora is the founding of the broad way. It is out of this dispersion of peoples that liberalism developed. There has always been a small remnant that make up the core of what is now known as the far right. The right has always opposed the left. But the drift has always been towards the left. One must swim against the cultural current to remain on the right. But even so, what the right is, is not what the right was any more than what the left is, is what the left was. The broad way could be considered the natural way, or the way of nature. At the center of nature is the law of the jungle. It is encapsulated in the dual doctrine of power which states, might makes right in the end justifies the means. The broad way is the way of power. Democracy is just the latest manifestation of this kind of thinking. Voting is meant to legitimize the power of the state. Another way of understanding the broad way is to think of it as socialism. Anything that justifies parasitism is part of the broad way. We either pay our own way or not. There is no middle way or third option. However, that being said, the core feature of the broad way is, in the modern world, democracy. Democracy justifies and legitimizes parasitism and the implementation of the law of nature. Democracy takes us back to the jungle because it puts all issues on an equal footing. One can vote for a caliphate or Sodom. The majority vote makes Satanism itself a legitimate life choice. If it is legal, it is good. The law, backed up by democracy, is the manifestation of man knowing good from evil. Man knows good from evil. This position is enshrined in law in every democracy. All the evils of liberalism are legal because they were made legal by a state put in place by a democratic vote. What could make Sodom more legitimate than the popular vote? Democracy, by its very definition, includes everyone equally. Everyone gets to vote. We all tacitly agree to abide by the result. What is good, what is legal, what is legitimate, is what comes out of an election, an election in which all take part in as equal creatures each knowing good and evil.